Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It is going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. This is the first time you're tuning in with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content out on the internet. Go to focuscompound.com to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. Uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter at, at Focused Compound. That is the best way to get access to everything we push out into the investing universe. And of course, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at Andrew at FocusedCompounding.com. So today's podcast, we are going to be going over a email that was sent into you as a response to our Money Mind podcast when we had talked about uh, this idea of Buffett having a money mind and investors having money minds. Um, Alice Schroeder had talked about Buffett's money mind. And it's this idea of you know money mind versus your own personal investing style. And exactly what does that investing style mean? And how do you carry that out every single day, right? Um, this question that was emailed in, the person says, I noticed that both you and Buffett have a wide range of investment styles. Okay, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, based on the pod, you seem to be considering industries that I didn't think you would consider, like mm -hmm. energy. Then there's your history with Japanese net nets. Mm -hmm. You've also talked about other asset plays. And of course, there's the quality companies that are well discussed on the pod. Similarly, Buffett appears to have a wide appetite of opportunities. His most recent investment in Japanese trading companies is in contrast to Heinz or Apple, exemplifying his range. And then he continues on, and then uh, the part that's relevant. So I understand that someone's style can appear to range across market environments. In fact, I believe the best of all time investors have a wide range of styles because they can do well in all types of markets and economic conditions. It's the same principles simply applied to different opportunities. Like you said in the pod, looking at things from all angles. That I do believe to be entirely true. But what about the average investor? I'm referring to those whose breadth of their money mind is more limited in application, their circle of competence is smaller, etc. Should they attempt to look for opportunities outside of their particular niche or patterns? Or should they stick with the style that uniquely fits their known biases, tendencies, personality, etc.? Let's say someone's personality is more inclined to quality, so they like the particular blend of safe and good. Should they seriously consider opportunities that are good enough and cheap enough, but not safe enough? Question mark. Or safe enough and cheap enough, but not good enough? Question mm -hmm. mark. Is this kind of extending past your normal appetite simply money mind at work, or is it foolishly going outside of your style and circle of competence? Which is really like what the question is here, right? Yeah. Where do you draw the line between money mind and style? And how right. do you wrap that all in with this idea of circle of competence? Right. And like we said, I think a lot of people don't have that kind of thing that we're talking about with the money mind. You know, the the books that really strike me that way um, in terms of covering specific people and how and that they had that kind of money mind would be um, Peter Lynch. Warren Buffett, Ed Thorpe, um, those are the ones that really stood out and made those books really interesting to read. Um, there are other investors who are very successful, but I wouldn't necessarily say that they have that money mind. And so in one kind of strategy, they may be really successful, but I don't know if going into other things and doing other stuff, they would be. Um I think that they had a strategy that worked and some strategies worked for a really long time and they could apply that. But in kind of the way we talked about the learning stuff, there may come times where um, the compounders just don't work at all because they're too overvalued or because that market's gotten too efficient or because of whatever. Um, or, you know, different kinds of value things don't work at all. Low priced book doesn't work at all. There's no net nets or there's no whatever. It That those efficiencies go away. Um, so, uh, we, I had talked to you about a book, um, going infinite, right? And Hey, I read it. You did. Okay. So I did read it. there's part of that book 
which I think is great for everybody to read. I think okay. it's pages 38 through 76 or something roughly like that. It's the stuff where they're at the, where the story and Sam, uh, th this is a book about FTX, um, is at Jane Street Capital. And mm -hmm. so it is what kinds of tests they do for things, how they think about things, the games that they play, trying to find the situations where they might have edge and stuff, some mistakes that they make, uh, why inefficiencies appear and they take advantage of them, and also why they, thinking that they do have better information than everyone else, which isn't that weird. A lot of times you can have better information than people and you can still lose a lot of money. So, And they manage to lose a lot of money, Gene Street, on that. So those stories are interesting um, mm -hmm. because it's what I'm talking about, about the money mind thing. They are... they created their entire, according to this book at least, intake process for bringing people on board their company, um, recruiting them and training them and stuff in just testing for this, which is to ferret out these inefficiencies to find those situations where you have an advantage over the other party that you're trading with and to take advantage of it. They did not, if this book is to be believed, do anything to check if there was any morality to the people that were doing it, if they had any sense of risk controls, if they had anything like that. And then they imposed that on top of it and kind of hid from everyone what the overall picture looked like. So they were responsible for their little thing and other people in the firm were watching to see about the risks that they were taking and everything else. And so they were, these people were not trained in a way that would be great for going off on your own and running a portfolio or something. Um, but they were trained really well to be part of a group of traders doing stuff. Um, and then the the sum of all those parts could be uh, something that would be safe and uh, consistently profitable, even though each of them was all that they really had was that they had a couple of things they were working on where they knew that they had some sort of edge. And um, they were trying to kind of pick up those pennies that way. It was very much like a test on logic too. It was had nothing to do with like stocks or this is how you should invest or think about markets or anything like that. I mean, when I was reading it, I remember thinking like, oh, this would be, I think uh, this is a interview process that Jeff would thrive in. Perhaps. I don't know if it's the best way of interviewing people and stuff. Uh, long ago, I talked to you about something. We did something where we tested for something else, not what they were doing exactly. But there is a question that they ask in the book. So they ask a very simple question. Um, I think it's something incredibly simple, like what's 7 times 12? He says 84. He says, how sure are you that, that your answer is right? So he's testing to see how sure he is that his answer is right, that he gave right away and stuff. So how quickly did you come up with it? But then the, the following question that other people might not ask is how how sure are you of that? Um, confidence level. Yeah. They also have weird things. They sometimes ask you questions that, you know, no one should probably want to take. Like they have a bunch of weighted, uh, dice, uh, actually they're weighted coins. They're, they're, you know, so they, they come up heads or tails more often than others. And they ask them to do some side bets and stuff, but occasionally they throw out a weird question. If the book is to be believed, like they say, how much would you want to bet on how weighted this is, which is great. I mean, how that's way too specific in terms of what they could know, what the true weighting is of it and stuff, instead of like, how much would you pay to keep flipping this coin or something? So they occasionally ask them things that someone might be like, oh, I think I can figure that out or something, but that you shouldn't bet on, right? And um, the thing with confidence, like there is a question in that book, which I mentioned to you is like, he's, his answer, Sam's answer, it was fast and very much like the same sort of answer. It's a few points off what I would say right away. Cause as I'm reading the book, I'm trying to imagine what it is, but basically there's a, a thing that you would think you pay 50, 50, you'd pay 50 for, because you know, if, if it's comes up heads and tails evenly, then there's no reason why you should pay more or less than 50 for it. So it has some value, but um, you know that it's weighted in some way, or you think that it's weighted in some way. And so how much would he bet on that and stuff? And so how much would he pay for it? And so he says 65 or something like that, but th that's kind of what the stuff is in there. And so that, is getting at the money mind thing. That's what it is. Now, there are some dangers to it. And he talks, uh, Sam later in the book talks about it, that if you frame things the right way, people get so excited about found money. 
And that is the danger with what Jane Street is doing in the uh, way that they set up the interview process and some of the way that they ran things and stuff. They perhaps are not careful enough about the dangers of people who think that they found free money things and how big the risks that they're taking are. We don't get to see in that book the other parts where they're controlling the size of their balance sheet and the risks and all that stuff to make sure that they're not doing things like that Trump thing that they did um, where they tried to basically bet on front running the outcome of the election. And they had better information, but they lose a lot of money. But, you know, the, the their reasoning for why they kind of lost a lot of money and stuff maybe in that isn't that great to think about instead of saying this is something we shouldn't be doing. So in that case, that's outside of Jane Street's circle of competence. They'd hired a bunch of people who have no reason to believe that they can make any calculations on the fundamentals of a market, of uh, businesses and stuff. In fact, they pick people specifically to be purely technically based what information is in the market, what um, technical aspects of buying and selling and who's participating and stuff is driving the market action and how do we take advantage of that? We might as well be, you know, you could be trading um, shares of Apple or you could be trading um, imaginary made up stuff or whatever. It doesn't, you don't need to know what the companies do or any of that to be able to figure out what this is that they're doing there. And that's what everything was based off of. And then they unfortunately do a bet on the presidential election in which it's quite important to understand fundamentally what is happening and why it's happening and not just to assume that you know which outcome will drive things in what way. And so I'd say that would be outside there. You know, I mean, this is ex post, right? They would say. So I'm looking with hindsight, but if we imagine that I was on some board there over seeing risk stuff and not doing actual trades, I would veto that kind of thing for Jane Street because it is specifically what they must never do. Like when you read about it and stuff, you're like, we must always do things that are based on who knows what and how the function in the market works and not do anything that in any way is important what the thing is that we're trading. Um, and that the, the, that is an important part of what they were actually doing, whether they understood it or not about the presidential election. Mm. Um, Can I give context really quick? Yeah. So for people that haven't read the book, SBF, has, as uh, Jeff had said, he front ran the election. Um, they were short uh, going into the election and they made like $300 million. And as anyone that remembers election night, the market reversed and went up. So it went from being, um, Jane Street's like most profitable trade ever to it being like, they were down 300 million and one of their worst trades ever. And I think the book had said that they actually weren't upset about it. I mean, I'm sure they no. were, but it was really much more about like the process. They said they felt like the process was, uh, good, I guess, as opposed to the outcome. I don't know. I think they thought the, the, the I think they thought the process from the junior employees and stuff was good. I th they, they did say we're not going to do this again and stuff. And so maybe yeah. they thought that the process from the senior employees was not good, though they didn't say that to everyone. What SBF's problem with it was is that he just thought it was overall good and they should have found a different trade to do in it. Um, that's possible, but there is a you know um, basically it, it involved the assumption that because they'd seen a pattern before where when it seemed that Hillary Clinton's odds of becoming president were higher, the market was doing well. And when it seemed that Trump's odds were higher, the market seemed to be doing poorly. And based on that, they made what was a very large bet on something that doesn't normally move around a huge amount and stuff. And so not only did they manage to bet the wrong way, but they bet the wrong way on one of the most big days movement in that for, I mean, the, the degree to which they made a bet that it would be hard to randomly ever make a bet that bad is big. I mean, they really managed to pick like the worst thing of how much you could lose money that quickly in that instrument. I mean, that you can't lose that much money in the S&P normally that fast. Um, so uh, it, it was interesting, but the reason why they went outside their circle of competence in that uh, is because they b believed correctly that they could have information before other people could have. They did not spend much time caring about what that information meant because most of the information they've been in possession of in the past uh, was of a completely different nature than this kind of information. You know, not to get all philosophical and stuff about this, but Jane Street was not based on having information like the kind of information they had in this case was knowing like uh, that they 
were on the set of a movie and saw how production was going that they knew uh from the product team at apple how it was going for the next thing that would be launched and stuff it is of a completely different nature than the kinds of things that they had which is information really about the market um this was more fundamental more basic information about the actual things underlying it and so they probably should have known that we are not competent to do that specifically because of how we employ how we screen for our employees who we bring in all that there would they just would not have people there who would understand how to do that it's not a bad trade for hedge funds and things that might have people who understand um macroeconomics fiscal policy uh politics all, all those sorts of things where they did not understand any of those things um and so you can have the information and still be in a dangerous position uh, you know, and that's what happened to them. So, and the other thing that doesn't get into in the book is it's very possible that both on the other trades and on that, that they, and they don't say it. So maybe it wasn't happening. They said that if other people were doing this trade, it was probably small, but the other danger that they're always exposing themselves to, if you do what Jane street kind of stuff does, the big danger of how you could blow up is that you're putting on the same trade that other firms are putting on at similar size to you and stuff. If you're all borrowing money, or even some of you are borrowing money, you can really get into problems with that. And that's the real way that those things can go down. So it could have been the unwinding of some things that had made a mistake on that. And the fundamental aspects of it not even being as big one way or the other as that everyone was betting, perhaps incorrectly, that Trump doing well was bad for the market. If a lot of smart money was making that same bet, then when there's any sort of reversal of that, it could be more violent than it would otherwise be. Um, but, you know, they downplay that in the book. They don't talk a lot about it, although they hint that maybe some other people were trying the same thing. Carl Icahn was on the other side of that trade, if you remember. Mm -hmm. He made like a billion overnight. Cause he, and that's very Carl long, Icahn. Like, futures. Yeah, that's very Carl Icahn because he's a contrarian that way and, and almost less fundamental than some of the investors we're talking about. It's not so much if something is good or bad or something, but just has something fallen a lot is it hated a bunch then knee-jerk you know reaction to that it's not just that something is cheap but that it's dropped a lot or something is the mm -hmm. carl icon way right he's yeah. more of a contrarian investor than a value investor yeah so how do you uh distinguish though between you know the money mind um so looking for opportunity and not diverting too much from your style or does that not even yeah. matter right you just keep value in this philosophy as your north star it keeps you out of going into things that are just at crazy like bubble uh, levels. Uh, so you don't, you're not going to get hosed in a way. And it allows you to sift in, you know, other industries that perhaps maybe other people wouldn't go in. I mean, I think investors, they put themselves in this value box or value mm -hmm. bucket. And that means you can't invest in like in over the counter markets that on the surface looks like it's trending at 20 times earnings right, right. Uh, when in reality they convert more of their earnings to free cash flow so you have to look at it differently it's almost like sometimes investors they think about it too much as a quant right where if you yeah. take value in this philosophy you're able to go into other um situations and you know again use value as your north star but look at other things that uh you know are different and interesting i mean buffett uh, we've talked about, he's done things in commodities. He's done mm -hmm. things in international banks. He's done a bunch of different things, right? Yeah. The other thing to talk about in that section of the book, which is why I think it's really good is that the obsession that they have, they talk about a game that they played where they talk about how many dice they had in their pockets and stuff and bet on it. But, uh, they talk about adverse selection, right? And so this is a thing that we talk about a lot off air I talk about with people because sometimes people get obsessed about their ability to know or not know something rather than does it really matter that I don't know this if other people don't know it, but it matters a great deal if it's possible that other people know this and I don't know this and then it matters. And so worrying a ton about oil prices, here's the thing, like all the research you could do on oil is going to get you to the same conclusion, which is that theoretically is possible within a move of a few standard deviations to ruin all of your oil investment ideas, to make them really <laughs> smart or to make them really dumb. And those are normal yeah. movements in the market for oil. So uh -huh. it doesn't take a lot. You can just say, let's go two standard deviations. Okay. All my ideas are bad. All my ideas are good. Right. Um, the important thing is do is the stuff that I don't know here stuff that other people do know and that I'm being fooled by, or is that not the case? 
And in some cases, oil is a globally traded commodity. Lots of people do whatever things in it. Uh, U.S. Treasury stuff with interest rates and what the Fed's going to do. It doesn't matter. It's not known, but it's not a disadvantage to us versus other people. The people who are spending all their time trying to get information on that are not gaining anything versus us when trading with us. So they can look at satellites and do this and do that and whatever. But in the long run of what we're buying in a security that way or what we're predicting for a bank stock based on interest rates or whatever, it doesn't matter. And the information isn't important that way. Right. So it's unknown and it could hurt us. It could, you know, it's a hot potato that could blow up in anyone's face. But it, it, it could blow up in our face, but it could blow up in the face of anyone who does deep dives into this stuff. The Fed doesn't know better than we know about long-term interest rates and stuff. Um, so don't worry about it is a, a simple answer to that. Now, worry about it to some extent. What I mean is don't worry that other people all know what the interest rate will be in the future. That's why the stock is the price that it is. Do worry that... Uh, under certain circumstances, the stock could fail or something if interest rates change, and especially worry about it when other people aren't doing that. So um, if you think about like, uh, what, what? in fact, at one point they're like, would you, you know, in, in essence, like they could say in that book, you know, like, would you like another card or something? Like, do you want to buy more? Uh, cards and things the other way you could think about is like buying more information or something they could have set up those games to say okay do you want to pay five chips so that you can see um uh one person's hand or something you know like there there's a price to information and how useful it would be to make calculations on things and so generally when we make certain kinds of investments that seem unusual to people it would be for the reasons of considering how important it is that um uh, the information we don't know whether it matters a great deal or not. So net net stuff, for instance, there's a lot of information that matters a great deal. And once you have that information, it's not that important to try to address the other parts of the information uh, that you would need. So not a lot of time is spent normally on net nets picking specifically which companies are the best or picking how good the future for the business will be. Um, their time is not spent trying to make a five-year prediction for what their EBITDA will be and stuff. I was saying that like with Jerish, where someone did that, I think that's not a good way of looking at the stock. Um, I understand that that's the, the, because we build all these comparables that you have a certain way that we're supposed to do all stocks. I think that's wrong. Um, that, that doesn't make sense and that's not the right way to look at it. And you shouldn't be taught just to create Excel sheets for all companies. Um, there's very little faith to be had in what the five-year prediction is for something like Jerish or something, but the possibility that it will have some good years or not um, makes sense. Uh, so when it's trading as a net net, it may be a valuable purchase. And when it had really high returns on capital, it might be a good short. Uh, it's too small a stock and stuff for for that. But but basically, yeah, if it did, it would make sense that way because you could know enough about the business that they were in, contract manufacturing, clothing stuff, um, to know that c competition would come in and quickly compete away very big returns. But also that competition, you know, has to exit the industry when everyone is making really low returns. And so that has to come back up eventually. So you don't want to pay a very high price for something like that. And that's why you would short it when it has a high return on capital. Um, and, but then that's also why you would buy it when it's a net net. But if you could get access to information on the people involved. So like my focus on Jerish and stuff would be who controls the company. What's the stuff with Hong Kong and what they do there versus listing in the U.S. The business is actually in Jordan blah, blah, blah. That stuff is all the information that's really important to have. And that would be good to have information on that others don't have. Because if the information told you that those people were honest and that there was more value instead of less than you might think in that um, uh, overall stuff that they had, you know, they like they bought out like an office building or something that they had and things like that, where some people might say, okay, so that's worthless because that's some sort of insider dealing or something that that must be. Um if you found out, oh, no, there, that was a legitimate thing that they did and that will create value, um, then you could come out with a much better um, knowledge about whether to own the stock or something. So that's where th that kind of information would be really useful. At Apple, it's probably not all that useful or that important to know much about the top people involved, how honest they are and all of that. It probably doesn't matter that much. The information is totally different. So um, that's why when I talk about... Buffett, Ed Thorpe, um, those people in those books, they really have the money mind. 
in terms of knowing what's important and what's not important, knowing that they can make bets on things they can't possibly know the answer to, but that it's a good bet. Um, you know, Buffett did his index bets, which were bad from the perspective of collateral and stuff, and ultimately not a good decision. But they were good in terms of bets, and they were pretty lazy bets to do. But the terms on which he was offered them and stuff greatly favored a good outcome that way. And I might be willing to do the same sort of thing, even if I thought the market was overvalued or something. There are certain points at which you'd be willing to offer insurance on it being below a certain price by a certain date that isn't unreasonable. Um, if it hadn't put any pressure on the balance sheet at all or anything, because you just trusted them to um, pay them off at the time that it ended, uh, then it wouldn't be a problem. You know, like if Moody's wasn't looking at it and saying, oh, I don't know, this might hurt your credit rating or something. If, if it hadn't been that, um, then I think that those, you know, would have made sense. And the fact that he came up with doing that kind of thing um, shows that money mind that he has. And Ed Thorpe with the warrants and also the little bit in it about the, the, um, uh, thrift conversions or whatever they were, the SNL convert, um, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when he asks, should they attempt to look for opportunities outside of their particular niche or patterns, or should they stick with the style that uniquely fits their known biases, tendencies, personalities, et cetera? What would your answer be to that? Right. So obviously you had said that having a money mind allows you to just sort of see these, uh, see and sift out these other opportunities but mm -hmm. for the average investor maybe yeah. they have a full-time job they're not doing this every single day uh, what would your advice be it depends on the person and what you think you're good at and what you think you're not good at um there are probably people who should only trade and never invest there are people who should probably invest and never trade anything there are people who should focus a lot on situations in which it's important whether the people on the other side are honest and stuff and there's other people who should definitely avoid that because their judgments are strange about you know that so you have to ask am i a good judge of other people am i a good judge of these arbitrage type things in these scenarios when that happens how is my thinking in terms of probabilities and stuff versus how's my thinking in terms of the quality of uh, a business or something and when we say quality of a business is that judging the organization and stuff or is that judging consumer behavior um you know buffett is not a phil fisher investor really you know, he has a great deal of um, similarities to Phil Fisher from the outside people looking at it, but his focus is all on consumer behavior, psychology of certain things, the incentive of certain things, and is not on evaluating the organization. Phil Fisher's is completely the opposite, looking at the inside of the organization and going out from there instead of Buffett's consumer focus and coming in. Buffett really couldn't tell you whether IBM is a good or bad organization, whether AMD is or something, whether they are investing in R&D and they have the right focus on things and whether they their human resources stuff is good and whatever that Phil Fisher would be really focused on. Buffett would just know, you know, the consumer behavior and stuff. And so he would have to stay focused on those things and not focused on other things. And then you could also look at what things tend to trap you and stuff. So, you know, Buffett has a real attraction to certain sort of, like we said, doing the thing that the um, going infinite where they're talking about the Jane Street stuff, you know, the finding free dollars, right? So Buffett does have that risk with things that have high enough yield and stuff that's guaranteed. So the preferred stock things and stuff, some of them worked out for him, but he has to be more careful on that than on a straight purchase of a common stock because he's relaxed his standards in those things and um, engaged in things that would probably be more dangerous and he wouldn't do um, for that reason. So it depends on your judgments and how they work out and to be honest about analyzing them. I was reading the book, The New Financial Capitalist about KKR. I mentioned that before. It's a great book. But one thing the book doesn't really address is KKR makes mistakes a few times early on that companies go bad. Um, there's actually a common pattern between a bunch of them. KKR seems to have understood EBITDA very well, but not to have understood cash flow and how it works. And so several of the companies that fail are because KKR doesn't understand what happens in terms of the difference between when a company is growing and shrinking. And this would be much harder back then because publicly traded companies wouldn't have had the same levels of disclosures of things like cash flows and stuff. And it's not captured by EBITDA. So like they make a mistake where they invest in a company which um, is basically like a uh, – has a working capital cycle that's like a Dell or something, right? The, uh, Dell computer, you know, where uh, it's being funded by customers, right? 
And so when the economy turns over and that company uh, sales plummet, the working capital cycle means that there's going to now be capital coming out of the business. You're now going to have negative flows, right? And, um, it, you know, there's different ways of seeing about the mistakes about that, but they they were not equipped to analyze growing companies with unusual cash flow dynamics. Uh, KKR had trouble with growing companies. They When the cash flow dynamics were very simple, where EBITDA and free cash flow, uh, I mean, cash flow from operations stuff were very similar, and growth was unimportant, uh, KKR could analyze them very well. But And the book doesn't get into that in analyzing it, but it's actually a, a similarity that's noticeable right away that these companies are different from other ones that they were involved in. And that they actually failed in part, that they went to bankruptcy in part because of KKR putting on those um, requirements for paying off debt and stuff to a company where it'd be dangerous to do that. Um, so like I talked about Omnicom, Omnicom had a problem. They had puttable bonds that they did, and it was a very smart thing to do. It was kind of like an edge thing. The CFO was unusual compared to most public company CFOs and thought, oh, I'll take advantage of the situation. Our stock is overpriced and stuff. And they did. And under normal circumstances, it wouldn't be a big deal, but the bonds could be put to them. And the problem with an ad agency is that when your sales plummet, when your billings plummet, um, you actually go cash flow negative during that brief moment. And not a big deal, except it happened that the plummeting advertising business and the financial crisis hit the same moment, right? And they hit because the financial crisis basically called caused a collapse in advertising. And so suddenly people wanted to put these bonds to you and stuff in a situation now which you couldn't get capital and everything. Um, so th that's, you know, different. Like they understood that when they entered into it. And it was a long time between when the bonds were issued and when they were going to be put to them. Um, so lots of things changed and whatever, but they needed to understand that. And you could easily see how, if they'd have been an LBO or something of something like an ad agency, that the LBO might've been handled badly. I'm sure that nowadays private equity things understand this well, but in the late seventies, early eighties, you can see that they struggled with certain concepts that were outside their circle of competence and not others. Growing companies were a problem for them. And um, companies that had negative working capital and stuff where it would reverse, um, that was really tough for them, like float-based things and stuff. They really were better with uh, – they they had done all their investing and stuff in like industrial product stuff and things. And so there was a very specific way that they kind of probably understood how to manage cash flow and stuff. And so they really were EBITDA-based even when that wasn't the right approach to use. And so there's some things outside and, you know, but like Jane Street, I don't know if they learned the lesson or didn't learn the lesson from the book. It's kind of like, eh, stuff happened and, and, you know, there'll be mistakes like this and stuff, but, um, it's not random chance what failed inside KKR's, uh, portfolio. There are some symptoms of, uh, some connections between them that you can pick out. So um, I'm sure there was bad luck in some of those and good luck in others that caused it. But I don't think it's purely luck that the things that failed did fail. I think it was structured badly from the beginning as being a target for an LBO and how to do it. Um, so um, that is kind of what you want to think about is like, what mistakes am I making all the time, right? So um, like I have a strong bias towards free cash flow, right? So it's very easy for me to make a mistake with a company that we know will have a lot of free cash flow and might be stable for a while and might not require assets, um, actual invested capital, but that will drop like a rock in some later period or has some serious issues about durability or something. So, you know, Buffett and Munger bought Blue Chip, I probably would have too. And it worked out great. I mean, Blue Chip worked out better than most other parts of Berkshire probably for them. But that's because they took the float and put it in other things and whatever. I don't think that they actually anticipated. I think they did better than they anticipated in the stock. But I think that the float and the business, let's say the, the revenues of the business stuff, declined far more than they expected. Um, and you can see the same similarities. Whether So if this is Blue Chip or it's NACA or whatever things, you can see the same sort of things and see that that's a risk. Um, whereas lots of other people would avoid those kinds of things. And that wouldn't be a problem that they might get involved in things that would be dangerous that way. So um, that's a strong bias that I have towards free cash flow things. Um, 
and it's a potential danger of things that have that. Uh, there's also some dangers in terms of, um, uh, well, I would say, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the main ones. There's potentially some other ones that you would say, okay, is it something that you want to be careful about? I don't know that it's necessarily things that are far outside your circle of competence, but uh, it's hard because Buffett said like the best decisions are almost the ones where the numbers tell you not to do it. And that's yeah. true. Cause you like I the business so much. That's what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's true, but it also can be confusing to people because Buffett has never paid that much. I mean, he paid a ton for precision cast parts, just maybe some other companies we could think of where he paid a ton. Um, but it would be very rare. I mean, maybe, you know, there might be things where the people involved in stuff. So maybe 3G involved stuff and maybe Cap Cities, ABC with Murphy and stuff, you know, that he could be pushed to pay prices that he thinks are kind of high because he believes so much in the people doing it. Um, but uh, there's not a lot that I can come up with where he really pays what anyone considers a high price. So what he's saying is more you can pay 13 times earnings instead of seven if because you love the business so much or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 15 instead of 13. Yeah. 16 instead of 13. Now, when you had said that there are some people that should be traders and not investors and mm -hmm. some investors that should be traders and not investors, what, uh, what do you mean by that? Well, there are people who are good at ferreting out information, acting on the information and stuff, and um, maybe not so good as buy and hold investors in stuff. Like, would um, you put like David Tepper in the investor box, right? I don't know how much you know about him. Yeah, but I don't know. My interpret. Okay. Well, he takes like this, this top down, uh, you would probably call it like, I don't know, they, the, the style, maybe like global micro, like you take a top down approach and then find bottom up stocks to sort of fit whatever this narrative is in your head, right? Like, is that a trader? Is that an investor? What is that? It's hard to say. I mean, that seems pretty typical of hedge fund things. I mean, I, was, I read the book by Leon Cooperman not that long ago, and there's only like one chapter that's of real interest to people on this podcast, so I won't recommend the book. But um, it they do have an book. they do have an element of that um, in that they that while he was maybe more focused than others on the the bottom up part of it, um, they did overlay on top of it the the um, top down thing. And felt that that was an important thing for a hedge fund to do. Um, it's a good title. From the Bronx to Wall Street. Like yeah. Um, so, the, I don't know is the answer to that. I mean, some of those hedge fund ones I think are hard for me to figure out what they're doing exactly. And what that means versus the strategies that we would use and stuff. Um, I when I said trading things, I meant like really, really trading things. That that's tough because it's in between sort of things. But you know, trading things. Look, um, I think I recommended to you a from the Substack letter a day, right? I recommended something. Okay, so there's one I did not mention to you, but it's someone who worked at Renaissance, and they talk about why they don't invest in the stock market. And basically, they're like, I don't invest in the stock market because there was one point at which Renaissance was like less than a week away from going bankrupt and stuff. And why did that happen? It's because day to day and stuff, it doesn't matter if you buy a stock and hold it forever. Yes, it matters. But what is set, the prices are set by day to day and everything. You can go anywhere based on the information that the people in there have and whether they're able to borrow money and buy things, whether they aren't able to borrow money right now, it's the participants and what they're doing and all of that at the table. Right? So, I think a trader in some things could do that. There are some people who we've invested in stocks where people have talked to me and said, oh, I make so much money. Like I just trade that stock that you do that because there's bid ask spreads and stuff on it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've added it up and it's you can't make a lot of money doing it. But yes, it, if you're asking, could we like make a market in some things and stuff and that you turn out profitable? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it can be done. Sure. Yeah. You can look at things and have, I mean, you've had that experience. We've bought things for weeks, months, whatever, we can see some things about how much impact we're having on the market, what other people there might be in it, what whatever there is. Um, and we could get excited when there's more volume or whatever, you know, so uh, there can be, 
that they're there, I don't know if I believe in a lot of ways of doing things. I do think it is possible people could make money as traders by completely ignoring what they're trading. If you're just asking what information is in the market and what is the dynamics of how people buy and sell and know what they're doing, and um, uh, it does not, I literally don't know what these things are that I'm trading. Yes, I, be, I believe that. The Jane Street is not far from that. Um, and I think that that's possible. Uh, I don't know how much you can blend the two things. I think a totally fundamental approach looking at a business, which is more the Leon Cooperman thing where he's talking about, where he says, look, you look at a business, the first thing you do is say, what's the business worth like control, corporate control. You look at like the market for corporate control. If the stock is selling for, if pieces of the business in stock form are selling for less than the stock would, the business would sell for in a total transaction, then you're allowed to buy it, you know, then, then it's legitimately, this is something we can do. That's his sort of def as far as he'll go in terms of being a value investor is you have to buy it at less than a private owner value as Buffett would say, because that in other, otherwise, what is the point of investing in stocks and stuff? If they aren't lower prices, then um, people would buy control of it. Then what are we getting out of it? Why wouldn't we all just go buy private businesses and stuff? Uh, you could say, oh, well, we might not have enough money and this and that and, you know, um, but really, how do we expect to make money over time if it's not that it's less than the, if the pieces aren't less than what the whole would go for in an auction, then we shouldn't be buying it. Um, and so that's the fully fundamental approach that way. Uh, they layer on other things with it with the analysts that covered things and stuff, kind of telling them if it's an opportune time to buy into it or not, you know, more like you're talking about with Tepper. But if it wasn't for that part, they'd be fundamental investors, right? with that basic um, un understanding of it. And so I think uh, most, eh, I don't know how to put this. Uh, a lot of people are very inf interested in, um, well, people put a very high value on information that they think they have that other people don't have and stuff and are very excited by that. And, feel that they should act a lot on that in terms of the trading things we're talking about. And so some of those people probably should be more traders. Um, I don't know how you define that and value things. Maybe they should buy things that they think are going to go up and sell them more rapidly and whatever. But these things don't necessarily have a huge impact in a long-term fundamental thing about the business. Um, and so I don't know why... Um, I don't know why you would focus on being a Buffett type investor if that's kind of what you're drawn to, right? If you have the instinct that they had at Jane Street with the election, I don't think you should be an investor probably. I mean, we could psychoanalyze everything about that trade that they did, but there are just things about it that are... um. You know, it's uh, it, it's completely understandable that they did it. And I would think that people who were brought in with the kind of interview process they talked about and stuff would 100% uh, do that kind of thing. But it's also the kind of thing that Buffett would not do, right? He would know you could get that information and he wouldn't go ahead and do it. And would you put Carl Icahn in a different bucket? Yes. Because the stock, because the market was crashing overnight and he's more of a contrarian and he went or like on contrarian investor yeah he's not i mean he does different things and stuff with rating and stuff in his early years but carl icon is a contrarian investor like david Draymond and stuff and not a value investor looking at the value that it is i mean when we say like when i say i'm a value investor for instance one thing to point out is um i don't care if a stock is at an all-time high or an all-time low at all so like Walter Schloss would care about that. Buffett would not care about that at all. I would not care about that at all. There's different kinds of people um, in terms of investing in things. It would not enter into my process at all to know those facts. And, you know, I say this a lot in emails and things, but look, what you know about everything you know about a business, you know, everything you know about a, a stock is uh, the past and everything that matters about it is the future. It does not matter what it earned last year. It doesn't really matter what it's earning this year that we're in the process of when we're buying the stock. It only matters what it earns this moment forward. You know, it, it doesn't, um, you know, there are some cases, I mean, Disney has a library and stuff. There's some things that are built up in the past that will continue into the future that we know for sure. But for the most part, 
all that matters is the future and the past doesn't matter at all or doesn't enter into it. And so um, it doesn't, whether it's gone sideways is new high, new low doesn't matter to me. The pessimism of those things don't matter to me. The whole thing where we have the overlooked stocks thing is mostly because of a great fear that I have of um, everyone kind of drifting to doing the same sort of thing, right? So even when I'm talking about Jane Street doing trading things and whatever, and it sounds like it's completely different from what we would do, I do to some extent have more respect for that than for what most asset management things are. Because at least it's uh, a belief that they're trying to find a profit pool that they can take advantage of over time and to find new ways to find new things to um, uh, new hunting grounds and things to continuously make money on that and not just a belief of going in and not being able to separate gambling from um, trying to find situations in which you have an edge and stuff. And so, you know, my great fear in terms of how we're compensated and everything is that it can easily drift into something in which you just gather a bunch of assets and invest in something that is awfully similar to, if not the S&P, then to some value bucket thing that people could get by an ETF or whatever. So I don't want to drift into being a quant thing. I don't want to drift into being um, just a representative sample of value type things or of the S&P or whatever. And uh, that's more the the focus on these overlooked things and whatever is because I think that you want your... If you're investing in a trading thing like the Jane Street thing, you want it to be the trades they select and stuff. If you want it to, to invest in a, uh, a fundamental investor-based things, it's stock selection, right? I don't want it to be like asset allocation stuff of why that they look at us and they say, oh, here's a bucket that's 100% stocks that's kind of off this benchmark and that's how I'll do it. It should be that the gains and losses that they get are because of what things we pick in that selection and that that varies a lot from other things. And uh, we can do that for better or worse if we focus on overlooked things. Um, you know, and so that's what, why that focus it's, it's not, um, there, there isn't any other reason for it than that we, we could do, you know, um, I mean, if I was managing my own money and stuff, there are things that I would, do differently. Yes, there would be more adventure in our arbitrage things or whatever, probably, and some stuff like that. Then there, there would, uh, yeah, that would probably be the biggest difference, I would say, than how we invest things for other people. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Some of it is just like it's hard to execute and manage accounts type things that we do and stuff um, about when people would have the information about it, what it would look like, what the tax things would be, what whatever things would be. I mean, that's the biggest difference I can tell you is that we'd invest in stuff that causes tax. If it was my own money, I'd invest in stuff that causes you to file more tax information. Yeah. The most inefficient market, pain. the most inefficient market that there is, I could, we could just list thing after thing after thing. I mean, KKR, I mentioned, right? So one of the early partner, uh, well, he wasn't, he was a tax lawyer who basically told them how to do all their tax stuff and was critically important to the early days of KKR, even if he wasn't a super senior person, was Saul Fox. And he's gone on to control um, a company called Global Indemnity, which is publicly traded and probably mm -hmm. worth more than it trades for. Um, and Global Indemnity like is- 300 million a market cap, right? Yeah. It's a property and casualty million. insurer. Yeah. And um, it's listed on like Quick FS and stuff, I think as Global Indemnity PLC, as if it's a UK company. It's not, it's an LLC. And so an LLC that uh, is making the election so that you would have to um, file extra tax information and pay taxes on it and stuff, which is what they're doing, Global Indemnity LLC, uh, is going to drive away a lot of people and stuff. There's not a lot of market for the stock and whatever, and a lot of people probably aren't buying it for that reason. It is... Um, basically a tax thing to be ta for it to be tax efficient and the stock to be inefficiently priced. Um, and actually it's, there's a decent chance the company will be sold or something and it's probably worth more than, you know, I mean like it, the pop could be pretty big when it does sell. Uh, I don't know all the details about it. I followed the company a little bit and I, I mean, compared to most things, it, it is cheap and uh, the cheap, cheap for things with a catalyst and stuff in this industry. And I think the reason for it, some of it could be the guy who controls it and, you know, the company's past behavior and stuff to some extent, you know, that they haven't sold out in the past and stuff. But I think a big extent of it is the taxes. Um, I just, you know, I found that to be true 
we've t- talked about things where I said, can we trade this? You know, an interactive broker says no for managed accounts. I mean, that that list of things that I wanted to buy that an interactive broker says no to, that list is golden if you get your hands on that, right? Because that sure. is, those stocks are mispriced because uh, funds and, and investment things, stuff like us, who spent the time to look at everything, then end up not buying it because we would have to switch from interactive brokers to some other means of how to get it. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. Um, what is yeah. the, what was that Substack that you had referenced? The Renaissance Technologies. Oh well, the the Substack there? is a letter a day. Okay. Yeah, but the, yeah, and so one of the um, things it had was a speech, actually, I think to a school um, from someone who worked at Renaissance. But the point he was making, I think, because he's not an investor and stuff, I think it was very true that people don't appreciate the the. Journalists and stuff talking every day about it. Oh, it went up because of this. It went down because of that. They connect things whether they make sense or not, right? Um, so, you know. There you go. Uh, yeah. There you go. Better Letter than 123. 123. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was 2020. Um, but I all I mean is that he, the, there, you know, the, there is no... The stock goes up or down day to day. It, it has no impact to a fundamental investor. I mean, it may have impact to how they feel and stuff, but it's doing that for technical. I don't mean that in like reading a chart and guessing what things are going to be, but like technical in terms of who's involved in trading it, what they know, what their resources are that they could put towards this or not. We talk about that with arbitrage and stuff, why the spreads the way they are. It depends on various things, but sometimes the spreads are the way they are and stuff because there's only so much that the that group is willing to allocate of their overall portfolio to it. There's only so much money you can borrow and stuff. Spreads could widen out just because of changes in borrowing things. Um, you know, uh, I knew someone who interviewed at a thing that was like a Jane Street type thing, a different, but but uh, had a you know, but was trying to do the same sorts of things. So it had a whole different way of how to bring people in and interview them and evaluate them and stuff. But um, truthfully, their goal was to find ways to make 4% in, you know, when things are only about as good as we were, uh, you know, hoping or whatever. And 6% if we get lucky kind of things in terms of return on assets. Um, And now the Fed funds is five something. But back then when it was zero, um, having something that did four to six percent using like as much leverage as humanly possible um, was fine because as long as they could find a four to six percent annualized return that made the money consistently, so people got their monthly statements and it looked like it was making the same amount of money month after month, which is what this was trying to do. It was trying to focus on getting the same returns every month instead of focusing on getting very high returns and stuff. They wanted to find stuff that wouldn't matter what the market was doing. Um, then that worked. But now with, you know, with cash, what it is, it doesn't work as well. So, um, you know, I mean, to borrow, so they, they would have to borrow, you know, it's a problem. Um, but I mean, because of that, that would explain why there would be spreads that would be attractive on some things or not, right? If, if there's all sorts of firms that might be doing things, but then can't because then money really costs something, or they can't because there's some costs on their balance sheet for regulatory things, you sent me something about treasury stuff and the treasury market. It, some of that's just regulatory, like the biggest banks it's that they would need exceptions and exemptions to things and stuff to do certain kinds of stuff. Because if it changes the regulatory situation, then changes, you know, capital things and stuff and for regulation, then they wouldn't do it. Whereas small banks that might be exempt from that kind of stuff would do it. There are things where they're like, they do notice, like, I mean, even banks have talked about that are perfectly safe, do notice and say, you know, we're, when you adjust for our loss on our um, bond portfolio and stuff and whatever, you know, we're going to be getting towards having not a lot of equity. You know, they're, they're not judged on that. So it doesn't matter for them being shut down, but uh, we're aware of that. And so I think that even in some cases that may stop them from buying back stock or something um, just because they're like, well, that'll make it look even worse. And some people are going to look at this and say, you know, that this is a, that it's worse that way. So some things might avoid high leverage, even, um, even if there's not much risk to it. 
because it's not the best way to evaluate things. This is literally just how much leverage you're using. There could be a lot of banks that are levered eight to one. Some of them could be very dangerous and some could be very safe. If you were totally normal bank levered eight to one, you'd probably be pretty safe. But if we actually look at the list of banks that never operate with more than eight times leverage, we'd probably find that they're doing pretty risky stuff. And that's why they're only levered that much. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I mean by the def d distinction between trading and investing stuff. Trading stuff asks about why that is. As an investor, I don't ask about why that is. I think that sometimes when I bought preferred stock and stuff, it's because there's different um, buyers for common versus preferred in the same company. Can't prove it. Don't know. I think it's true. Um, certainly preferred sometimes behaves oddly uh, in financial, um, in sort of financially distressed times when the regional banks are failing or in 2008 or whatever. Um it, it, you know, and, uh, or COVID, remember we talked about, um, MAA, um, the apartment thing that had uh, preferred stock out and stuff. And the, the common stock of that did not get slammed to the extent that would ever threaten the preferred. It was a very small preferred issue behind a huge, um, market value amount of common stock. And that just seemed like very sure thing, uh, because of that. And it, probably is that the same people don't own common stock in an apartment REIT kind of thing as own preferred stock in it, um, I would assume. And also the difference in size, that one's billions and billions of dollars and one's quite small. And so some people may not even be aware it has preferred stock out and stuff. Um, but, you know, it, you know, I mean, that's also another thing in the, uh, the book, Going Infinite, uh, is they did answer a question that always baffled me, which is why if FTT had a claim on FTX revenues, anyone bought FTX equity instead of buying the coins. Um, and they just kind of said, you know, VCs want equity and they don't do that. So, you know, you know what I mean? The VCs just wanted the equity. The other people just wanted the coins. No one looked at both of them and said, these are awfully similar things. I mean, a claim on a third of the revenues of an enterprise and a claim on the earnings of an enterprise are very, very similar securities. And yet the two didn't really want the other one. No one said, oh, I'm going to sell this and buy that. No VC said, I want to take it all in coin. I don't want any equity stuff. Um, you know, so, I mean, they did an issue of all that stuff and they didn't buy it. And then later they were willing to pay a lot more for the equity in the actual business. Which would matter if you had voting rights and whatever things, but they didn't put anyone on the board, so it didn't matter. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I know who asked this question and stuff, and I just think that the personality of the person is important. And so I would ask maybe people around you who know you well, and I would look at what your biggest mistakes have been in the past and what things have um, worried you the most and were most difficult on you. Um, there's lots of things that I would do that I would not suggest other people do. Um, because, well, okay. The, the most important thing really for this is whether you can evaluate what you'll be in like a hot state when you're in a cold state, right? So like evaluate it in the future self. This, so when you ask people, they always say that this stock that they're looking at, if it dropped 50%, they would buy more of it. You know, they're not going to buy more of it. This is in their imagination that this is going to happen. The situation that's going to happen when the stock drops 50% is there's going to be a lot of reasons for that and a lot of scary things. And even if there's no reason for it, people will create a narrative to try to explain why it dropped 50%. Um, and so this is going to be uncomfortable for people, and they might not be that likely to buy it. Some people might buy it, and the contrarian type things you talked about would but it's important for people to evaluate how they would actually behave under those conditions. So that's really the question about whether you should go outside your circle of competence that you want to think if you think about it, like sitting there with a therapist or something. What I would ask is, you know, okay, when this deal fails and falls apart and you lose X amount of money on it, how will you feel and stuff? Um, why I don't recommend things like simple arbitrage things to people is because 90 or 95 percent or whatever the deals work out and you make the money you lose the money in the other things depending on how you have a tendency to blame yourself for stuff and all of that um it can be psychologically difficult 
the the way that you're doing it is you're basically putting aside on every mo- amount of money that you make as you would with a loan or something that some are going to go bad and that you're going to take a loss on that and so the returns you're getting are not really as good as they appear to be on the good deals but you'll take that loss you know with the bad deals that happen there are other people Joel Greenblatt certainly seems to be one based on you can be a stock market genius who you know gets all worked up about that it's a nice funny story but yeah, a random mm-hmm. thing happened with a sinkhole and stuff. No one could have known that and whatever. And yeah. you know. Um okay. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um I talked about there's a net net. There was one net net that I invested in that I lost money on, right? And it looked like a better setup than normal because there was a catalyst, right? But the problem was the financial crisis happened, right? So, you know, then they weren't able to liquidate it as normal and stuff. So actually if you'd been in net nets that that weren't planning to liquidate, it would have been better. Being as something that was planning to liquidate, I lowered my standards because of the fact that it was going to liquidate and everything. And it didn't take into account the possibility of, you know, there could be a financial crisis and whatever. Um, the situation probably didn't exist purely because everyone saw there was going to be a financial crisis. I don't worry that much about it. Okay, you lost money on it. Like, it, it's not a big deal. And um, I it, it doesn't get me worked up about that. You know, and th- there's lots of things like that. Um, there's we've watched many things go up a lot and come most of the way back down or whatever, and uh, it it doesn't necessarily bother me when that happens. If it does bother you a lot, then you might want to be a trader or something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, you if, prefer the alternative, right? Well, I here's the thing. Um, not. <sighs> Not really. You can't really prefer it. What I mean is there has to be a distinction between what should I have done then and what did I do versus um, should I uh, – versus like like wanting to have sold at the top is not actually something that enters into the mind of probably someone like Buffett. It doesn't enter into my mind. The top is just a random point that occurs – through total randomness and stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the market's mostly random walk of stuff and it, do, it doesn't matter that way. Um, but that he didn't sell Coke might bother him. It's reasonable to be bothered that you didn't sell Coke. It's not reasonable to be bothered that you bought in October or whenever he wrote his, you know, op-ed by, you know, American or by now or whatever. Um, and, uh, whatever it was, the March, first week of April. I forget when it, things bottomed out in, in 2009, but but sometime in March or April or whatever. Um, so, you know, uh, th- there, are, there are ones that are like, so you look back and you say, you have to think about it, and w- I'll give you a good example, okay? So different people would look at this differently. Um, I know how, uh, how Sam from Going Infinite, uh, SBF, would think about this, and I know how I think about it, and others might as well. But during COVID, we were offered uh, – it was it was the moments before the Fed stepped in, basically. It was at that moment where the Fed is about to step in or is stepping in um, is when you sort of bottom out in that – in the late weeks of March of um, 2020. We were offered a block of stock, and the discount on the block of stock was probably 50% from what anyone who knew the business and stuff would think to start – you know, that this is a reasonable price or whatever. So we're, so we're being offered something that's at a 50% discount or something. Um, and we know that the reason we're being offered is purely the distress of the seller. So this gets you to the Jane Street type stuff. So we know all of these things, right? Um, the stock is not immediately marketable, um, even if the market kind of gets back a few months later and stuff. It, it, the, the block itself could be sold off in, in pieces in time. It's not totally illiquid or something, but... You know, effectively, this is for the COVID panic, uh, a block that can't be resold reasonably. I don't think the market can absorb this. So, um, and it's not huge to move the needle for us, but it's a few percent of the fund or whatever, right? And we could do this. So uh, it is, as they'll say in that book, Going Infinite, expected value, right? This is of my lifetime and stuff, sort of the big, obvious expected value thing. 
Uh, it is a calculation that you can make at the moment that is the some of the most free money you've ever been offered, and you understand why it's happening. It has nothing to do with the business. It's not the market predicting anything. It is one person whose personal finances are collapsing because of the things that they're in and that COVID is causing disastrous things to happen that way. So we know exactly why it's being sold to us. And we're also the only realistic buyer in terms of it that you'd know we'd have cash and say yes immediately, right? We said no. I said no. Um, so why say no? We said no, and it could be unreasonable to say no, but basically what I did is I just had a hard cap on how illiquid we could get at that point with the expectation that if we're in a bear market and panic and whatever with COVID, that we can start to have um, people at the first opportunity say, I would like to withdraw money. I'd like redemptions from the fund. Now, this never happened because the market bounced back or whatever, but we don't know if that happens or not. We had cash beyond the requirements for this thing. Uh, and there is not, and this is why I'd say, like, this is where it's a personality test. Rationally, the percentage that we would put into this versus the percentage that we already had in illiquid things versus the amount of cash that we had on hand versus the worst case redemption schedule would tell you that this can't be the straw that breaks the camel's back. We could be in, have problems without it in the worst case scenario. We could have problems with it, uh, but this isn't going to make the difference. Now, the people in that book will all take this deal. And anyone Jane Street would take this deal. And I think that you should have taken the deal. And, you know, that would have been better off that way. But I had looked for a while and thought about what is the exact cap that we will do no more beyond, given uh, the amount that was actually pledged that would come in and stuff. And that was it. Um, you know, if we had been some giant fund that had access to things that would give us credit and whatever, maybe we would buy it. But we didn't have other ways to bring in uh, money except partners putting it in and they could have all decided that, you know, the market's down 50%, their businesses that they're all in variously are all in having problems. I mean, things could have been very bad with COVID. It could have been like 2008 all over again or whatever. So we just were at the limit that way. And so we just said no. And that was it. Um, the actual tweaking of that knob to how much risk you were taking wasn't a very big tweak, but we were at, to me, a red level that I didn't want to go beyond. And uh, so, and it's the same thing when we talk about banks and how much they have in deposits versus how much they put in things and whatever. There's some level, they all can decide on what it is. And do you do anything beyond that level and how much of it do you do? Um, but my thinking was a lot more black and white, right? So like in that book, there's an early thing where his investors all become worried that he may, uh, you know, not such a good guy or something. Basically, the whole team quits and stuff. And so they all basically decide to stay in, but they all dial back their level of investment, right? So that's a very gray sort of way of looking at it. And that's not a bad way of looking at it probabilistically and stuff. Let's reduce our exposure to something, but not get out of it completely. Um, I would be all in or all out on a decision like that, probably. Right. Because you worry about after that, well, then all your other decisions after it, you might put, you know, it seems like you're not risking that much money right now, but if you then start to leave the money in now, then you might put more money in later. And, you know, it leads you down a whole way of thinking that isn't just a one-time decision. Um, so, and that's the, that was with this. If I'm offered this one thing, that's amazing. And I buy it. You could say, okay, if you know that you're going to do this and only do this, then you're fine. But what if the next block comes to me at a 75% discount? Do I keep taking everything that has a better expected value and stuff that I know is way below intrinsic value? At what point do I stop, you know? And so it's just a level that we said, we, you know, that's it. Um, and like regulators and stuff impose that on certain institutions and things. But for other people, it's a self-imposed regulation. Um, so I think that, it's a very long way of saying that it's your personality that matters for these things. Um, and your attitudes towards risk. And um, there are some things that are just big differences between people. I think one of the biggest ones is most people like to be in the green for a given position. 
So one thing is like, yeah. So that's one thing that I would say to everyone. Um, there may be special cases when you meet people and you realize the differences, but they really want to be somewhat positive, even if it's not very positive. Um, it, you know, that they, they kind of desire that being right um, more than like financially how that pays off. So most people truthfully will be like the Peter Kundal, um stock doubles, I'll sell half of it or something, because then in their minds, they always are ahead they won't ride something to a hundred X or something. So even though we talk about the coffee can portfolio, I think coffee can portfolio is great for some people, but it's like a smaller segment of the public than actually will watch a video on the coffee can portfolio. Um, you know, and, uh, then there's other people who are only attracted to certain kinds of things. Uh, I don't, I mean, a lot of people get interested in certain more complex things that I would kind of warn them away from, I guess. We've talked about that with the Whitney Tilson thing and all that. I'd say, yeah. Um, so I always feel mixed because when I rec – look, when I bring up something that's odd, it's probably because it's like really attractive versus other things or not really attractive but really certain in some way. So I'm not going to bring up that the preferred stock and common stock of something trade inappropriately unless I really believe that. right? I would never mention that. But I think most people are going to – it's not going to be good whatever purchases you're going to make out of learning about preferred stock for the first time or something. you know. But I do see that people will get like obsessed with that and like go down that and try to make a purchase. Like Usually you're, you're best off in things that you know a lot about beforehand and then you can make a decision really fast, like lightning fast, because you already know about the situation. It's not likely you're going to learn about leaps for the first time ever and then make a good investment in them or learn about – you know, that whatever it might be. Um, but you could do a smart decision in a merger or something. If say like it was a company you owned currently or like you still own the stock or you had looked at it before you had come up with some value you thought it was worth. And now you see that the takeover is being done at a price worse than that or whatever. Like that would be fine. Say, you know, we talked about the, uh, I guess we didn't talk about Pendragon Lithia and stuff, but we've talked about other car dealer ones. You might have liked the stock at a certain price. And so the first merger arbitrage stuff you should do probably is something you've looked at, an industry you've looked at and you think is cheap and stuff, you know. So you can move out in that one way. Um, but, you know, there's other people who are less, you know, thinking in those terms and stuff. So, I mean, I know from the email that it's someone who's more qualitatively oriented and stuff. Um, so I would start from there and kind of talk about what – how you can translate that into other things. But I don't think that like, I, I would never say to him that arbitrage would be an appropriate thing for him to do based on the, cause I know his personality and stuff a little bit. Mm -hmm. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the focus compounding podcast. Uh, if this is the first time you're joining us, be sure to check out all of our content on the internet. Uh, hit that subscribe button, wherever you're listening or watching and be sure to follow me on Twitter at, at focused compound. If you would like, uh, a question of yours to potentially be featured on the podcast, uh, you could send it to me at andrew at focused compounding.com. I thank everybody so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.